I'd like to welcome uh, Admiral Miller, Captain Byrne, Dean Phillips, Mr. Gladchuck, Mr. Stein, a member of the Naval Academy Board of Visitors, Mr. Tigert, Mackie Tate Tigert, J.T. Tigert, and our other distinguished guests. Uh, my name is Colonel Art Athens. I have the honor of serving as the director of the Naval Academy Stockdale Center for Ethical Leadership. And on behalf of the center, I'd like to welcome you to the Volgeno Honor, Courage, and Commitment Luncheon. The Stockdale's mission is to empower leaders to make courageous, ethical decisions. And we envision this luncheon contributes directly to that mission. We designed this particular luncheon series to accomplish the following objectives. First, provide a unique and enjoyable venue to listen to accomplished leaders from diverse professional backgrounds and have them address the core values of honor, courage, and commitment. Second is to limit the number of invitees to enable the participants to not only to listen to the speaker, but also engage in a meaningful dialogue with the speaker and each other at your tables. Third is to invite midshipmen, staff, faculty, and coaches to encourage interaction among these key elements of the academy community. And finally, send our audience off inspired, instructed, and challenged, and better prepared to lead in an extraordinary manner. This lunchtime series is made possible through the generous gift of Dr. and Mrs. Ernst Volgeno. Dr. Volgeno is a 1955 graduate of the Naval Academy, a career Air Force officer, though he was rooting for Navy last weekend, and the founder and chairman of SRA International, an information technology firm with over 7,000 employees headquartered in Fairfax, Virginia. So I'm going to have you enjoy your lunch. I'll be back up in a couple of minutes to introduce our guest speaker, Travis Tigert, and we will go from there. So enjoy your lunch. But I do want to introduce Travis uh, to you and then have him come up and uh, begin to, I think, provide us with some important insights into integrity and honor, courage, and commitment. Travis Tigert is the chief executive officer of the U.S. Anti-Doping Agency. And I could literally provide many details about this remarkable man's life to include his passionate advocacy for the integrity of sport and clean athletes through his writing, speaking, and investigatory work. Could also talk about his recognition by Sports Illustrated as one of the 50 most powerful people in sports. But I believe I can do no better than to share with you the words that were written by Dick Pound, who's the former chairman of the World Anti-Doping Agency and a member of the International Olympic Committee, who wrote about Mr. Tigert when Time Magazine recognized Travis as one of the 100 most influential people in the world in 2013. And this is what Dick Pound wrote, which I found fascinating. This is what he said, the measure of a man who does his duty is not what others think of him, but his own commitment to doing what is right. Travis Tigert heads an organization dedicated to protecting athletes who play fair from those who don't. No one would argue with the philosophy of doping free sport, but few are willing to undertake the demanding work of identifying cheaters and imposing sanctions on them. Proving what many already suspected about Lance Armstrong, in particular, was especially challenging given the relentless media and legal tactics organized by Armstrong and his team, which were increasingly directed against Tigert personally. Some wilt under such circumstances. Others become even more determined not to succumb. Tigert's work was so thorough that once the courts predictably dismissed Armstrong's challenges, he had no other alternative but to face the music. Armstrong folded and later confessed that he had in fact doped for many years just as the US ADA had charged. He got what he deserved, stripped of his Tour de France wins, a lifetime ban, and the ignominy of having cheated other athletes and those who believed in his achievements. Mr. C Pound concluded his write-up by saying, score one for the good guys. Today in the Wall Street Journal, there's an article that has excerpts from a book that's going to be coming out in publication very soon. The title of the article is Lance Armstrong, The Downfall of a Champion, and the book is called Wheelman, W-H-E-E-L-M-A-N. 
and the article references Travis Tigert and the work he, he did, but if you want to get a snapshot beyond what's talked about today, it'll be more information about what this man has done. So we are very honored to have what I consider both a patriot and a hero join us today to talk to us about honor, courage, and commitment, not from the standpoint of a military man, but the standpoint of someone who had to undergo the same type of pressures that all of us face in different ways and to come out on the side of right. And that's exactly what Travis Tigert has done, and we're thrilled that he's here with us today. Travis. Well, thank you. It's, it's, it's fantastic, obviously, to be here, and thank you for that overly kind introduction. I want to thank the Admiral Miller um, for inviting me here, Colonel Athens as well. Um, I'd also like to thank Bobby Stein. Some of you may know him, but he's on the board of visitors here at the Academy, and we've got some other guests who have come up from Jacksonville, Florida. Gray Camp, who's a, 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 a retired Navy, um, his brother Craig, uh, nephew Will, as well as Tony Curlis, some of the um, great business leaders of Jacksonville, Florida. And, and I tell you, we all are humbled and excited to be here. I think um, all the time we carry around a little guilt, but a lot of time we carry around a lot of guilt for not having the courage to serve our country in the ways that you all have. So it is truly an honor for us to be here, and, and, and I hope to and have gained as much um, thus far from my trip here that I hope that you will gain by my, me speaking here today. And, and quite honestly, I wasn't sure it was going to happen because when I got the invitation, uh, Marge, who was fantastic in helping arrange it, said, well, Travis, send me your book and we'll order a few of them and have you sign your book after the talk. And, and I kind of punted and didn't really address it. I said, oh my gosh, I don't have a book. So are they gonna, are they gonna revoke the invitation you know, for me to be here because I don't have a book. But, but interestingly, in the book that I did select, and, and Marge later informed me that I didn't have to have my own book to be here, but there's a fantastic book that I hope you'll pick up called Seven Great Men and the Secret of Their Success. Um, and there's one chapter um, about George Washington that I thought, to me, was the essence of leadership as I experienced it through the course of this Lance Armstrong case that I hope you'll pay particular attention to. And it, and it was when Washington was leaving his troops for the final time, and they gave him all these you know, uh, applauses and recognition and accolades and said something to the effect of, Washington to them, said some, something to the effect of, any reputation that I have acquired derives from you all. And certainly that wonderful introduction, Art, I appreciate, but any of those Sports Illustrated or Times certainly derive from the people that we serve. And to me, that's the essence of being an effective leader, is having a mission and a purpose, not unlike what you all do day in and day out. And I'm blessed to have an incredible board of directors, but tens of literally millions of athletes around the world who rely on us to fulfill our mission and the oath that we swore to protect their right to compete on a level playing field. And, and but for us, you know, genuinely serving them, we would obviously not be here. And any reputation that our entity or any of us personally have derived obviously comes from them and the mission that, that we, we protect. So that said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dive into a little bit of the Lance Armstrong case and, and hopefully some of the lessons of leadership, values, ethics, and integrity you'll hear through a, a pretty entertaining, hopefully, but pretty fascinating tale that I, I don't think is unlike a lot of, whoops, we might be at the end, but we'll go to the beginning. Um, it's not unlike a lot of the headlines that you see and, and questions whether or not in today's society you can be successful without cheating. And you look at these headlines and it appears that all those people that have made millions and billions of dollars who have led celebrity lifestyles, they've all done it by breaking the rules and cheating somehow. And it seems to be acceptable to succeed in our, our country, whether you're in business or in sport, in order to, to be successful, that you have to break the rules. And you just hope that you don't get caught. But I think the, the biggest message from the Lance Armstrong case is that, in fact, is not the case. And really, the only way that you can win is by playing fair. 
And at the end of the day, those that do play by the rules, yes, we want to compete, and we want to compete hard, and we want to be the best, and we want to win. But it's winning the right way is the only way to truly win and be successful. Doping, or the use of performance-enhancing drugs or methods like blood transfusions, and if you read the Wall Street Journal article today, you'll, hear, you'll see a, a, a pretty dark picture of them taking out their blood storing it and then during race days in fact the story that's depicted in the journal today is on buses lying on the floor and having the blood reinjected that's called a that's a prohibited blood transfusion when you use someone else's or your own blood in order to gain a performance enhancing benefit clearly prohibited by the rules and all of the athletes knew that it was prohibited by the rules but but that's the basic notion it's it's not unlike the the loss of ethic or values that we see in other aspects, not just sport. And, and we think it's important because sport, for those of you who play, and I suspect there are a lot of people in this room that do play at some level, um, it has great value. It can teach lessons of life that we all hope to gain, whether it's teamwork, whether it's self-sacrifice, physical conditioning, mental health. You see a, a few stats up here. Um, as a father of a young girl, daughter that's here, I, I love this one, girls that participate in sport are 80% less likely to have unwanted pregnancies and 92% less likely to get involved in this is abusing drugs. I mean, those are the values that sport can teach. And, and at the end of the day, doping or gaining an unfair advantage completely erodes these very values. And quite frankly, even if you look at sport as just as an economic benefit, as entertainment, and you hear a lot of people say that, well, who cares what professional athletes do? They're adults and they're, you know, they're providing an entertainment and we could care less if they use these drugs or not. At the end of the day, it, it erodes the, the very um, nature of what sport is supposed to be, which is both competitors or both teams, whatever the event may be, playing by the same set of rules. You know, in basketball, we don't have one team playing on a eight foot basket and the other team playing on a 12 foot basket. That would be totally unfair. And, and that's very similar to the rules of, of against doping in sport is to create a level playing field for all the competitors to compete. At the end of the day, we firmly believe at USADA sport lessons, so the things our kids, you all are learning on the playing field, equal lessons of life. And if you're willing to cheat as an 11-year-old in a swimming competition, then you're going to go on and cheat in business, mortgage industry, investment banking, law, politics, whatever it may be. And so it's critically important, we believe, given that sport is a teacher of life lessons, to ensure that it's played by the rules that clearly exist. So what is USADA? And, and I think from a leadership standpoint, I put this slide up here and asked the question, what is the strategic plan? We went through, as a, as a board, we have a 10-person board of directors, about a 42 um, to 3-person staff. We went collectively through um, this process, and we asked ourselves, what do, what do we want to be? Are we just an entity that collects urine? Or are we here for something bigger than that? And, and I really stress, particularly the students here, ask yourself about your career and your personal life. What's, what's your plan? What's the strategic plan? And I'm sure you all have gone through the leadership classes where they talk about how to effectively define and articulate what you want to do two, five, 10, 15 years down the road. And, and go for the moon. I mean, we call it the moonshot at our office. We want to look at our, look at our vision to be the guardian of the values of the, and the life lessons learned through true sport. So it's, it's not just a, an agency collecting urine and blood. We, we do do that as well. But we're shooting for something by far bigger than that. And, and I can assure you, when you go through a crisis like we went through, and you're going to hear about in a second in the Lance Armstrong case, unless you have a very well-defined, and, and to me, based on sacrifice, of yourself for the good of someone else or something else, it's awfully difficult and it's, it would be very easy to justify doing the wrong thing. And you're going to hear about some of those pressures in just a second. But we were fortunate with our board to have gone through that process years before finding ourselves in the crisis. So when we were in the crisis, we knew what the right thing was. We swore an oath. And quite frankly, it was pretty easy. Once we had that principle behind us, and it lived each and every day in line with that principle. We do education, um, grassroots as well as broader. You see testing, I mentioned the urine 
and blood testing, you hear a debate, and I'm happy to answer some questions at the end about the NFL and human growth hormone and why doesn't the players union want to have human growth hormone testing. You, you can only detect human growth hormone through a blood test. So if there's not a blood test, you can bet in competitive environments, particularly at the professional level, athletes are going to be tempted. In fact, there was an article today, Jerry Jones came out and said, we got to get human growth hormone out of the league. Uh, I don't think that's because they got beat by my home team, the Broncos, but <laughs> that, that might have something to do with it. Um, speaking of the Broncos, you see athletes attempting to circumvent these rules, and athletes will go to pretty so sophisticated means to ensure they don't get caught. Here was, you know, again, one of our uh, top defense alignment, um, Von Miller, who you know, essentially paid off the drug tester to collect someone else's urine so that he wouldn't have a positive test. He ended up being caught and ended up obtaining a six-game suspension as opposed to the four-game suspension if he just would have had a positive drug test. Here, here's one I like. It's um, a little humorous, but Sean King, some of you may recognize the name, was a top quarterback, played for the Carolina Panthers. Here, he got called for a drug test. And um, the drug tester was coming the next day, so he called his girlfriend and said, hey, can you send me some clean urine? Well, the test came back negative for drugs, but unfortunately, Sean King came up pregnant. <laughs> came up pregnant. So you, you see the extents that our, unfortunately, athletes will go to in order to, to try to be the best that they can be. And it's important to have policies um, in place for athletes that will protect their rights to do it the right way. We also give, in partnership with Major League Baseball, National Football League, roughly we have budgeted $3 million a year to research. And, and I get the question sometimes, well, Travis, if all these athletes will go through what Von Miller did and what others have done to beat the testing system, and you have to give $3 million a year to testing, and athletes like Lance Armstrong can beat the testing, Again, why don't you just let them do whatever it takes? And I think it comes down to four simple points. I, first, I, I'd say it's easy to use, everyone's doing it, so just let them do it, as an excuse to justify not enforcing the rule. But I think it's a very lazy, intellectual place to go because there's at least four, in my mind, catastrophic outcomes if we do that. Number, number one, all it does is move the line. So even if you say these athletes can use a therapeutic level of testosterone, enough that won't kill them, but will give them an advantage or allow them to recover, you're still only going to move the line. And those that want a bigger benefit from it are going to cheat, and you'll still be in that cat and mouse situation. I think number two, certain people respond to these drugs differently than other people. So you're not going to level the playing field by just letting them all use it. It would literally be, and these, and these are game-changing drugs, it literally would be like having some athletes using a wood bat and some athletes using a metal bat, how their own natural body responds to the drugs. For example, George Hincappy, some of you, if you followed the case, know the name. If you follow the sport of cycling, you might know the name. But GH, um, human growth hormone, was his drug of choice. It gave him a huge performance advantage. For Floyd Landis, growth hormone didn't help him at all. In fact, it made his legs tired. So it would be unfair because people respond differently to those drugs. And then three, and again, as a father, um, I think the trickle-down effect that would have on our kids, if you knew today in order for my son or daughter to make the soccer or the baseball team at the professional level, that they had to use these drugs at that level to stay competing at that level, they're obviously then going to have to do it to stay in the college level of those sports. They're going to have to do it to stay at the high school level. They're going to have to do it at the junior high level. So the question really becomes at what age are we as parents willing to inject our kids or give them these potent drugs in order to allow them to succeed at eight or 11, you know, nine-year-old sporting events. And, and then fourth, I think it erodes the very nature of what sport is supposed to be, which is natural competition. I mean, we have rest, you know, WWE. Um, that's different than Olympic wrestling. You know, that's entertainment. We have NASCAR, right, where there are machines competing against machines. But what cycling is supposed to be, what football is supposed to be, what baseball is supposed to be is natural competition. And one reason why we all love it so much is it because it's us in our head envisioning ourselves being able to do that, not, you know, having to have the best chemist or, you know, the, the ability to defeat um, the testing in order to, to, to do that at that level. We're not involved officially with, um, or, or we don't have jurisdiction rather, of professional baseball or football. Those are not Olympic sports. The basketball players, the hockey players, since those are Olympic sports, 
they fall under our jurisdiction, even the pros. So the Redeem team, that team that went and won the gold medal in London and again in or Beijing and then again in London, they all fall under our jurisdiction a year out before the Olympic Games. We, we do and are involved with this biogenesis investigation and assisting baseball, but that's a different process than what we go through. But you're going to hear, if you haven't already, a lot of similarities between our handling of the Armstrong case and um, baseball's handling of the A-Rod case, just to draw your attention to some headlines that you'll see here over the next few weeks. So to talk briefly about the cycling investigation, and, and I intentionally, in our office, intentionally defined it as the cycling investigation, not a Lance Armstrong investigation, because it was all based on information and allegations that we had received from Floyd Landis. I, I think kind of the ultimate whistleblower, and while I hate that term whistleblower, he, he was a person that came forward to us because he had trusted us, not the sport. In fact, he did not trust the sport. And I think as leaders, it's critically important to have um, the trust of the people that you're leading so that they feel confident bringing you this type of information where it's appropriate and then trusting you to handle it appropriately. And, and it's not an easy thing to do. And a lot of people ask the question, well, how did this story stay secret for so long about Lance Armstrong? And, and literally an omerta had built up around this sport. No one wanted to tell because they were fearful of what was going to happen if they told it. Floyd um, told the sport at one point in the past, and the sport did nothing about it. So it took an awful lot for him to come forward and gain the trust of those people that had the authority to act on it. And so I think from a leadership standpoint, the tone at the top on accepting the information, even if it's bad information, so that you truly know the culture of the people that you're trying to lead. So there aren't unwritten rules of the culture that you're leading, I think is a critically important lesson that we learn through this process. And it's not easy for leaders. You don't, you don't necessarily want the bad information. But you better have it as opposed to it's, it festering and reaching a point where it then creates legal liability, PR liability, personnel liability, whatever the case may be. And so we were thrilled that he came forward. And we had two requirements. Number one, tell us the truth. And number two, be full in everything that you tell us. So you can't just tell us about the people you don't like. You have to tell us about the whole culture that's out there. And there's been, of course, accusations that, well, maybe it wasn't the whole culture and it was just you know against Lance Armstrong because Lance had kept him out of the sport for so long. But at the end of the day, we. We're comfortable that the information he provided us was everything that he knew. And over a two and a half, three day period of time, we you know, interrogated him, if you want to call it that, but deposed him to gain the information. And then it was our, our duty to act, to act on the information. And when we heard these allegations, you know, quite honestly, as a, as a leader, it's your worst nightmare. Because you know, if you do your job, people aren't gonna like it. Here's a global icon, one of the most recognizable um, you know, athletes around the world, won seven Tour de France's, has raised hundreds of millions of dollars, supposedly for cancer research, has a three plus million um, person database of those who had given to the Cancer Foundation. And, and so as a leader, you're sitting there looking at it, what do you do? Be real easy to stick all this evidence in a drawer and never deal with it again. Do you, you know, maybe resign, let someone else take this mess and let them handle it. But you know, fortunately, as I mentioned previously, having a, having a vision, having a mission, having sworn to athletes that we're gonna protect their rights, it, it actually was a pretty easy decision. I mean, it would have been easy to justify doing the wrong thing, but if your principle is to follow through with your mission, then it actually was the easiest case we ever had to handle. Now, we'll get into some detail, but whether we go forward or not, Given the evidence that we had at this point, it was the most powerful and the strongest case we had ever had. And so we can hide it, and you might as well shut us down, and at that point, clean athletes have no hope. So it was actually a pretty clear decision. But again, one that didn't come overnight, it took having a principle, having an, an ethic, day in and day out, living and, and believing in that. So, so we strategized our, uh, this case because we knew that if Armstrong came after us, it was gonna be a, a war, so to speak, and, and that he was going to what he ultimately said was their goal, which was to bankrupt us and take us down. But you see one pursuit, 
And we, and we basically had a, a very quick, so the senior team could appreciate it, and we knew where in this particular handling of the case where we were going, but one pursuit. And the pursuit was the truth. And here's a letter you see that we sent to Armstrong inviting him in because we also wanted the athletes who were part of this culture to help us clean up this culture. And we in included him. We weren't just going to punish Lance Armstrong. We invited him to come in and be part of the solution. Before anything got public, um, before we brought the case, we did that. His lawyers rejected um, that opportunity. I think it's one they regret today. In fact, the Wall Street Journal article this morning talks about when we met with him in December of 2012 after he had received his lifetime ban. And, and you see a, a picture that I think I've said is about 70% accurate um, in the Wall Street Journal this morning. But the, the bottom line is he really wants to compete again. And, and really the opportunity for him to have the, the lightest penalty imposed was at the same time that 11 of his former teammates also came in to be part of the solution. So one pursuit, the truth. Two goals. You just saw pictures of the 2012 London Olympic team. This was the summer of 2012, and we had an Olympic team to field. And several of the athletes that we had evidence against, George Hincappy, Dave Zabriskie, some names, if you follow the sport, you'll know, Christian Vandeveld, they were going to make the Olympic team, go to London, win medals, and unfortunately, after they did that, we would have to take those medals back. And we felt that that was untenable, and we couldn't allow it to happen. We were sitting on the evidence, but we also knew at the same time, if we brought cases against those athletes, if they were unwilling to remove themselves from the team, that we were going to necessarily lead a case to Lance Armstrong. So goal number one was a clean Olympic team, which is our current immediate um, need at that particular time last summer. Goal number two was to dismantle the system. And you see a number of faces up here of doctors, team trainers, coaches. We also brought cases against them. Because to some extent, the athletes were victims of this culture themselves, sort of the unwritten rule within the culture, and they participated in it. But we knew it would be terribly unfair and not in the long-term solution to just sanction the individual athletes, give them the maximum sanction. We had to dismantle, and that literally was the term that we used around the office, dismantle the system within the sport that allowed this to happen. We're, we're thrilled that two weeks ago, Friday, um, the president of the sport that oversaw this culture during uh, the Armstrong affair, as well as didn't act after our reason decision came out, lost the election. I mean, it's literally the downfall of the commissioner of the International Federation, the cycle, Union Cyclist International, who lost the election, mainly because he failed to adequately protect the rights of clean athletes and the integrity of the sport within it. So this is a huge outcome for us. So moving to now the three fronts very quickly. Um, when Armstrong rejected the opportunity to come in, we knew we were, uh, I said battle. We knew we were in for a battle. And there were three fronts that we knew because one, we had experienced it previously with Marion Jones, who was an Olympic athlete, high profile, cover of magazines, you know, new politicians. We knew the tactics that she used. Armstrong hired the same PR operatives that she hired. So to some extent, we knew with the traditional media what they were going to do. And you can read it. It's out there, but witch hunts and personal vendettas and crooked process and bad motives and, and really try to isolate the head leader. And interestingly here, it was me that they tried to pick off, not, and I mentioned Edwin Moses on our board, Olympic great, fantastic athletic reputation. It wasn't him, because they knew that was a losing battle. They were going to go after you know, the CEO, an unknown person who was making an irrational decision to go after Lance Armstrong. And, and quite frankly, they were effective at it. And it took a lot out of, personally, us at the office, families. Um, and as a leader, you've got to be prepared. I mean, running this morning, I, I love some of the boats. Um, fearless and courage. I mean, these are real life terms. They helped me get around the leg, I mean, the river, by the way, <laughs> this morning when my leg was hurting. But no, I mean, those are the kind of terms that, you know, you see on walls, you see on boats, but they're real life. And they're the principles that you're going to have to come back to. And having the tenacity to live those day in and day out guys is what it's all about. So you see um, typical media approach where they were also very, very clever 
was using social media. And this was actually different than what we experienced with Marion Jones because social media didn't exist um, you know, five years ago. But you see Armstrong with his three, two million plus Twitter followers using very emotional words. And, and you guys are young enough to know, I mean, Twitter is not a legal brief. It's not, it's not facts. It's just make up a, as heinous, and that's the word he uses, of an allegation as you can, throw it in your 140 character tweet, and hopefully it'll, it'll spread like wildfire, and it does. I mean, it, the, social media has brought down countries and governments around the world. You guys read the headlines, you know it. It's extremely effective at swaying public opinion. But again, you've got to maintain what's our mission. We knew there was going to be a short-term hit. It's tough. We don't like it, but we accepted that that was going to be the consequence. It was also pretty interesting that the Washington Post was typically the media outlet, the, the traditional media outlet that they would use to get their first story out. Stated goal by Armstrong and his operatives was to bankrupt and, and literally kill us. That was their terminology, kill us off. We get about two-thirds of our funding through an appropriations um, through the government. And so having the Washington Post run those first articles aimed at us was extremely powerful. It wasn't by chance that his lawyers, big Washington, D.C.-based firm, also um, represented the Washington Post for a number of years. And it also wasn't by chance that the biographer who co-wrote his book was also one of the top sports columnists for the Washington Post. So you see the, the intertwined um, nature of this power and the influence all ultimately going to try to take us down or in their mind kill us off or bankrupt us. And, and you see headlines like this, you know, no basis in fact or accurate fact whatsoever, but just opinions. They also, um, this, you know, kind of interesting, but they also uh, recruited their celebrity surrogates. Here's one, Matthew McConaughey, most of you probably know him, but he sends tweets. Um, that one goes to a website where they have a petition to strip the tax-funded status of USADA. So an impressive, some might say evil, um, campaign aimed against USADA. Here was um, a, a press release, and I mentioned how they pick off the unknown leader. So it's celebrity against an unknown, and then they try to do everything possible to take them down. And, and here is Lance Armstrong's press statement that he issued the night that he exercised his right not to challenge the evidence that we had compiled. He could have challenged it. And we would have gone in open court, essentially, it's an arbitration process, but in open court, and we would have put every witness on under oath that would have been transcribed for the world to see, it would have been on court TV or whatever, but every witness would have taken an oath and bit by bit, piece by piece, the evidence would have come through in open court. Well, Armstrong, and, and we knew this was what was gonna happen, he didn't go that route, because he couldn't from a PR standpoint, go that route. He was better off just shutting the case down, trying to lob bombs at us and characterize us in a way that benefited him. And you see this here. Travis Tiger's unconstitutional witch hunt. You know, especially not Travis Tiger. So again, trying to paint the dialogue and the PR perception as this crooked person and this crooked entity that ultimately did this to me. The, the prior slide, um, it was August 23rd. It was at 10.15, I think, right around that time period. But literally less than 30 minutes later, you see the death threats coming. And here's one that came to our office that night. S others that came as well. Fortunately, fast forward a little bit. Fortunately, we turned these over to the FBI, found the right FBI agents who tracked it down, have now prosecuted. Um, one pled yesterday. Not this guy, he's pleading in November, but have pled guilty to felony convictions for making threats using the wire, uh, com wire communication. So, um, you know, again, you talk about fearless and courage and tenacity. These are the real life words that you all are gonna have to live in your leadership positions. We, we also got the political pressure. I mentioned the foundation previously put an incredible amount of pressure on us, mainly going to the Hill. I had to fly out to D.C. from Colorado, where we're based, four times that summer, meeting with individual members on the Hill. But here's their foundation coming after us in a big way. Sensenbrenner, who was ranking on House Judiciary Committee, um, who actually in the past had been a supporter of ours, 
introduced some legislation or co-sponsored co some legislation. Ranking member House Judiciary that arguably had primary jurisdiction over us in the House um, came after us in a really big way. Didn't even have the you know, decency, if you want to call it that, to pick up the phone or his staff to call us, to ask us about all these allegations, but was pretty quick to send a letter to the press and to the agency that oversees our funding, the ONDCP, the White House Office of National Drug Control Policy, the President's Office, challenging our process, our funding, again, in line with their effort to kill us off, to bankrupt us. Pretty ironic when it turned out, I mean, the letter was essentially written, we could tell by Armstrong's lawyers, but pretty ironic when it turned out Sensenbrenner was from the same congressional district as the bike company that sponsored the U.S. Postal Services team, Trek. And, you know, just like the author, sports columnist from the Washington Post, Trek had a lot to lose if this great seven tour victories ends up all being based on a fraud. It wasn't the Trek bikes that allowed them to win. It was the drugs that they were using that allowed them to win. So you can see, again, the power intertwined to ensure that this secret stayed secret for as long as it possibly could have. Um, here's the lobbyists um, for, the, for the foundation, obviously, were, were questioning the tactics there actually started to weigh a little bit PR-wise in our favor because people said, well, how, you know, how, how is this any business of the foundation? Um, but using something outside of um, the sport aspect was a, was a tactic that they attempted to use as well. Here, here was a, a group of state senators um, from California who sent a letter and requested an investigation by Feinstein um, there to, and Boxer, their two senators from the state, U.S. senators from the state of California, again, had to fly and immediately address the questions, sit down with them and address the questions that they may have had. Uh, I'm proud to say um, a graduate of this academy came to our defense in a big way. And again, not diving into the facts of the case, but Senator McCain um, had known about our organization, actually was essential in setting us up back in 2000 when we were formed, knew our process, and he sent a tweet, and it was fantastic, because the day after Sensenbrenner's office sent out that letter and all the media blew up, we got a call from McCain's office, and he said, Travis, what do you, what do you need us to do? We said, look, Senator, what, whatever you can do would be wonderful. Um, came to our aid, and, and that was a, a, a real powerful moment. And, and you see, again, um, he doesn't dive into the facts, but just talks about the process and the fairness of the process. So wherever you fall politically, um, you have to respect Senator McCain for stepping forward and, and, and giving a, a, a very beneficial um, press statement to us. Again, USAD is authorized by Congress and provides assurances to taxpayers, everyone, that the process is the proper forum. And Lance Armstrong, if you want to challenge this, if their evidence isn't what they say it is, then, then go to court and through their process and challenge it. And we were perfectly prepared. In fact, almost wanted to do that so that all the evidence could get out. So very quickly, we talked about the three fronts, the last front, and, and we knew the most important front. Although I think as leaders, you have to pay attention to the PR and the political because they can, you can ultimately win the legal battle but lose the broader war if, particularly if your funding comes from the federal government or you need support from the public in order to do your job. And, and certainly if we lost the trust of the tens of millions of athletes that rely on us to protect their rights, if they don't think we're doing it the right way or the fair way, then we might as well shut down as well. So you have to pay attention to the political and, and, and the other sides of it. Um, but, but at the end of the day, we knew legally that our case was as powerful as it possibly could be. Armstrong sued us, not unlike the A-Rod suit that you saw this past week, suing baseball to try to circumvent the established process and go a different route in order to get an outcome more favorable to them. Um, fortunately, the judge threw out the case pretty quick. Um, they refiled it. He then threw it out again. And you see that he basically says the USADA process based on federal law comports with or provides constitutional due process. So every athlete, and, and I think it all should make us all feel really good that our Olympic athletes are afforded constitutional due process prior to them being removed from competition. So you can have faith in the, in the system that before an athlete is removed that they've been given a full and fair process. Um, we also then had the individual doping case against Armstrong and his co-conspirators. And we ended up putting it all on the internet. 
and letting everyone see for themselves. And you see big categories of evidence here, 1,000 pages, sworn witnesses, financial records, scientific evidence. Here's just one example. I've got two examples, but one example of a test. This was an EPO test, actually collected in 1999 at the Tour de France. But there was no test. We talked about research earlier. There was no test for EPO, a very powerful, potent, performance-enhancing drugs will give you anywhere from a 2 to 15% oxygen uptake endurance performance advantage. So you imagine in a three-week stage race like the Tour de France where the winner is maybe 11 minutes ahead of middle of the pack, having a 2 to 15% performance advantage is huge. Well, this was, there was no test for it at the time it was collected. It was frozen under laboratory protocols. And then in 05, it was retested because the EPO test had been developed by that time. But what you see, and now Armstrong has admitted using it in 99, but we also had a slew of witnesses that also corroborated that they used EPO in 99. But what you have here on Armstrong's case, that is all, you know, the easiest way to look at it, that's all synthetic EPO, 100%. It's by far the most positive EPO case test that we've ever seen, what's known as 100% basic area percentage for any of you chemists in the room. Um, it's all synthetic EPO. We, we also then have blood tests. This is from the 09, 2010 time period. And you see a fluctuation in hematocrit and reticulocytes, your baby red, red blood cells, and the percentage of red blood that you have in your body, your hematocrit. And actually, this is hemoglobin, but another marker that tracks the hematocrit numbers. You know, most, most people, us here, not at altitude, we're gonna be you know, men, 42, women, slightly less than that. But you see a, a variation in those numbers that scientifically is determinative of someone using performance-enhancing drugs. The, this last section is, in my mind, maybe the most powerful evidence that we obtained, which was the eyewitness firsthand testimony under oath of all of those that participated in this culture. And you see 11 of the former teammates of Armstrong all of whom came forward when we confronted them. One came out, uh, Floyd Landis, as I mentioned, on his own. But all of these athletes ultimately came forward. And, and, I, and I think another really important lesson is that we all make mistakes, right? I mean, nobody's perfect. Um, all these athletes made tremendous mistakes. But when confronted with those mistakes, they acknowledged them. And then they said, you know what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put that aside. I'm gonna take responsibility for my mistakes and I'm gonna try to help this sport move forward to ensure that other athletes, younger athletes who come into the sport don't have to face the same dilemma that I faced to use these dangerous performance enhancing drugs in order to be the Tour de France winner. And so while they certainly cheated, I think you have to, on the scale of culpability, you have to put them um, you know, lower certainly than those that continued to deny and lie and cost us, you know, force us to spend money to prove they're cheating and enforce the rules. Um, they're obviously not the heroes. I think, and, and even Armstrong said, he and these people in the Oprah interview, if you saw it, are not the heroes. But the real heroes, you're gonna hear from in just a second. But once all this information came out, you see that the, 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 the truth was revealed. I mean, ultimately our pursuit, I think, came out. And, and, and people could decide whether they wanted to accept it or not. But at the end of the day, you couldn't um, attack us for doing something other than our job. And if at the end of the day we made the decision, if people don't want us doing our job, then we'll shut us down and we'll go find a different mission. But we've done our job. And fortunately, the truth prevailed. We did get, uh, I mentioned, I think the, well, I didn't mention it, but we got about 8,000 emails, which is a, you know, significantly more than we've ever gotten during a very short period of time. Some of them hate mail, some of them death threats, some of them, hey, thanks for doing what you're doing. We got a lot of apologies, honestly, from people who had sent things saying, why are you doing what you're doing? This is a global icon, leave them alone, to, oh my gosh, sorry for sending you that prior email, and thank you for doing what you're doing. We need more of that in our day and age, particularly in sport. Um, the media then turned, and you see headlines, um, case closed overwhelming case, all about the lies. So a lot of the, um, here was one that was actually pretty, you talk about pretty frustrating moments. This came out um, during that summer cover of Newsweek. 
you know, leave Lance alone, just scathing attacks against, you know, not only me personally, but our entity. Um, and then, you know, fortunately, Buzz Benzinger does Friday Night Lights. Some of you may have heard of him. Fortunately, he had the, the guts to call himself out and talk about how he was duped when he saw the facts. And again, we knew the legal case would ultimately drive the rest of the angles. I mentioned the death threats, but one of them just pled yesterday. So the real heroes, I mentioned it earlier. You're going to hear a very short little video clip from a teammate of Armstrong's. He's a 92 Olympian, Scott uh, Mercier, a teammate of Armstrong's. When the doctor of U.S. Postal brought him the drugs in 98 to use, he had a choice. And, you know, he had an education. He had a good support system, his family. But he made the right choice. Unfortunately, it meant he had to leave the sport. And he did. And he may have lost out. It's probably why you don't know his name and you know some of the others' names. But hear his words about that decision and after the downfall where it ultimately left him. And hopefully I can do this. The truth already. You know, the, the part that you just showed where he was explaining, talking to Luke and, and what he had to do with his children. My wife called me about four months ago and she said when this whole thing was breaking, aren't you glad you're not sitting down with your children tonight and telling them how you had to cheat and lie to win? And the winning at all costs mentality. I think that this really is a story bigger than Lance. It's bigger than cycling. It really goes to the core of ethics matter, doing things the right way matter. Um, and it seems whether it's business, academics, politics, that I think the, tire, the country's fed up. And hopefully we're seeing a cultural shift that how you do things is more important than the result. Yeah, no, no better conclusion that I could say. So, guys, I really appreciate your attention and uh, wish you all luck. I'm happy. I think... We're a little bit behind time. Can I take three questions? Sure. And I'll do it in three minutes. How about that? And then, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. What I'm going to say here is, so we have about three minutes. If you're a midshipman and you have class, the academic dean and the superintendent are like watching. So you really need to go to class if you have a, if you have a class. If you don't, we're probably going to go until 1330. But again, if you have a commitment, we're going to ask you to go ahead and, and uh, go to that go to that commitment. And then at the end, the books are are on the table there, and uh, and I know Travis is willing to stick around even beyond 13:30 if you have some individual questions. But we'll we'll take a couple of questions. If you just want to raise your hand and state who you are and go from there. Hey. Where was Lada doing all this? Point? I mean, it seems to me that. They should have had the lead on the Yeah, so question was where was WADA? WADA is the World Anti-Doping Agency, actually based out of Montreal. Um, you know, they were, they were supportive in a, in a big way PR-wise. Um, we got, a, a, as I mentioned, the sport, the, the head of the sport, Pat McQuaid, put, the president put a lot of pressure, had a huge press conference um, during the Olympics where they came after us really hard about our authority our motives, things that you know were way out of bounds for them if they wanted the truth to come out. And, and WADA was very good supporting us in that sense. And actually, when the legal case I mentioned that was filed in federal court, one of the issues was uh, the authority. Which, which agency was it? UCI had jurisdiction over some of the foreign athletes. But fortunately, by, by virtue of the rules that the world plays by, their rules said if um, you're a foreign athlete, Whoever discovers the violation of an anti-doping rule violation has jurisdiction over it by virtue of the rules, which is legally sound given that it was there. And so it, it was a fortuitous rule for us, quite frankly, that you know, we investigated all this and there were foreign doctors and foreign team trainers that we ultimately had jurisdiction over. So because of the, the, the rule that UCI had drafted. End of the day, they, they provided us support. They're not a they're not an operational entity, they're more of an overseer and a uniform rules drafters and then they oversee the system um, but they we were we were thrilled with the support that they gave us both in the case and also from a PR standpoint all right other questions yeah back here sir, if you oh will. sorry sir sir I'm Paul Montanis uh, lifetime cyclist but you know when you do you think that sport has changed because I've watched the last two tours and sky I know it's beyond US athletes but sky has dominated both tours can you watch it the same way? I mean, do you think in your experience that, that it's clean now or is it getting clean? Yeah, you know, personally, you know, half of my job is to be the skeptic no matter what happens. 
Um, the other side is I think it's really important that every athlete is afforded, you know, the presumption of innocence, and, and, and they are, unless and until through the established legal process it's shown that, that they're not. In fact, uh, I must have said that about 10 times about Lance Armstrong prior to this case, and even going through the case until that, that process played itself out, he was uh, presumed innocent. Um, I think the culture for sure in cycling has changed a thousand percent. I mean, we, one, we see test results. That, that longitudinal graph I showed you, um, you know, you, you used to see that a lot more commonly five years ago. That's called the passport program. If you follow the sport, you may be familiar with it. Um, it's a science tool that allows us to better monitor what's really going on. Um, so I, I think it's better than it's ever been. We also hear from athletes who say, you know, you've given us this case, but also this sport, particularly with the downfall of the president, um, has given them hope that they can do it the right way. You, you're always, I think, unfortunately, whatever industry, cycling, sport, non-sport, you're going to have those that are going to do whatever it takes to gain an advantage, whether it's doping, whether it's corking a bat, whether it's, you know, you know, Ponzi schemes, whatever it may be, to try to get ahead. So we just hope that you have a system in place that doesn't allow the full culture to go in that direction. Because if you empower those that don't want to lose to a cheater, then you have a real chance to win. And I think in cycling, that's exactly where we are today. And, and look, it's going to take a lot of effort to sustain it. Because given the demands of that sport and the money around that sport, but I think we're in a great position today. All right, one other, yes, sir. <laughs> I to get to ask the last question. The, uh, uh, Travis, you, you got to hear all of the statements from, from the folks as they came forward and ultimately confessed to this. But was there a, a commonality amongst the seminal moments, moments for these people as they finally decided that this was, that they had to come clean, that they, that they looked back and they said, here's where I, here's where I made the first mistake or, or how I got on this yeah. slippery slope? Yeah. You know, I think, um, one, and, I, and I should have mentioned this, I mean, their lack of preparation for the moment they had to make the decision, am I going to cheat or not cheat? I mentioned Mercier, you saw in the video. He, you know, he had a college degree, he was educated. None of the others did. He had a very supportive, you know, mom and dad. Um, he had prepared for that decision. And, and that's what I would stress to the midshipmen here is, is in, you're going to face, we talked about it at our table during lunch, you're going to face that decision moment. And so now is the time, hopefully it's not too late, but, but, but discuss it internally with your support system. Surround yourself by people that will support you in making the right decision. And, and be prepared for it, because it's going to come. And that first one, I think, is, is the hardest. Each one gets easier and easier to make the wrong decision as you go. But the inverse of that, I think, is true as well. When you make the first right decision, and I mentioned going back to making ethical decisions um, when I you know, was president of a fraternity, um, even. I mean, those, those, is, those are the moments how you gain experience and trust that making the right decision actually does pay off. And that playing fair, truly, as the title says, is truly the only way to win. So prepare yourselves for it. But, it, but there were different motivations. I mean, some, you know, they had moms and dads they had never told the depths of their cheating. So you can imagine how tough that was for them to come around. Some were still competing, so a sanction was going to be really hard for them. But, but we eventually got them to you know, separate themselves from the consequence that was going to happen and just, look, you're going to get a consequence. In fact, people are going to appreciate you taking a consequence. But coming forward and doing the right thing, you know, it's, it's going to happen one way or the other, with you or without you. And, and I think today, all those athletes would tell you by far the best choice they ever made. And, and look, Armstrong regrets back in June not coming in. I mean, he's, he's told us that. He wishes in June he would have come in. But again, he rolled the dice to try to kill us off, and, and, and it didn't work. So, well, thanks again for your time, and I'm going to be around, so thank you.